start in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy. We're going to uh, keep thinking that I'm going to wrap up this gospel of circumcision and uncircumcision. Now I start studying and just keep seeing more and getting more. Eventually we're going to make it to, back to the timeline and start looking at the dispensation of the law and things of that nature. But uh, this morning we're actually going to start looking, comparing what we call the gospel of circumcision and the uncircumcision. The, book, the books of Hebrews to Revelation contain the gospel of the circumcision. These things are written for Israel. What's written in Romans through Philemon is Paul's gospel of the uncircumcision. And we're going to show you, people, people run, they run to Hebrews, or they'll run to Peter, or they'll run to John, and they'll see things that are similar. Right? Yeah. yeah. But it's not the similarities that'll get you, it's the differences that will kill you. Amen. Mm -hmm. There are things written in Peter, James, and John that are flat out contradictions to things that Paul wrote. And if you, if you try to live your Christian life based upon the doctrines contained in Hebrews to Revelation, you're going to be living in a false identity. And those things will not work for you. And, and, and you know, for, for example, if, if, if Peter says, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, even though that's quoted in Exodus about Israel under the law, but we, we say, well, that's us. And God hasn't made you a priest and a holy nation in Christ. You're living in a false identity. Amen. You need to understand what God has made you in Christ if you want these things to take effect in your life. Yeah. Amen. And so look here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is uh, 2 Timothy's quickly becoming one of my favorite epistles that Paul wrote. You know, if, you, if you're saved by the grace of God, you know you're, you're one of Timothy's own sons and you're one of Paul's own sons in the faith. Yeah. Amen. What he calls Timothy, he call, calls Timothy all through there, my own son in the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, Timothy, Timothy was, was, was saved by Paul's ministry and, and, and Paul took him under his wing and taught him everything. Yeah. And I, I read 2 Timothy now and, and I understand that these, listen, these are the last words penned in Scripture right here. I know people, people, people try to tell you, let me show you this. People will try to tell you that the Gospel of John was written. Now this is just this is how tradition goes. They'll say the Gospel of John was written between 88 and 92 AD. Okay? That's what they try to tell you. They want you to think that what John wrote, the Gospel of John, the first and second, and third John in the book of Revelation. They want you to think those were the word, last words penned in Scripture. But you know what Paul said in Colossians? That God had given him the dispensation to fulfill the Word of God. Paul completed Scripture. In John chapter 5. Now you know what happened? When was Jerusalem destroyed? 70 AD. 70 AD. And they want you to believe that John wrote his gospel some 18 to 22 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. You know what John says in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 2? He says, Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Yeah. There is at Jerusalem. Me and Jerusalem hadn't been destroyed yet. Right. Every epistle in the New Testament was written prior to 70 AD. Yeah. And Paul right here, he's getting ready to be martyred. He's getting ready to give his life, and he writes 2 Timothy, and these, these, these scriptures that you're reading here in 2 Timothy are the last words penned in the Bible. And I think it's interesting. Look over there in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. You see it? All scripture. You see that? It's what? Given by inspiration of God. The, 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 the last book of the Bible, the last book penned by, by, by under inspiration is the, is the very book where Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And as I read 2 Timothy, understanding that these were the last words penned by the Apostle Paul, the last scriptures penned by man, the book takes on a whole new meaning. And look there in 2 Timothy 2.15. 
That's an important verse, folks. Paul's been given the revelation of the mystery. He's been given the dispensation to complete the word of God. And you know what he says right here? He says, he says, study. Study to what? Show thyself approved unto God. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something, man. Neglect of that book. I don't care what else you do in your life. Neglection of the word of God shows God exactly who you are. And it has everything to do with your relationship with God. Yeah. If you haven't studied, you have not shown yourself approved unto God. <coughs> A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Look at verse 16. This is what you should con this is how you should contrast. But shun proof is okay, so we are to study the word of God. And then in, 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 on the opposite spectrum of that, we are to shun profane, that secular, worldly. Yeah. I, can't, I honestly can't believe Joel Olstein gets 52,000 people to show up to his church every Sunday. Yeah, yeah. I am beautiful, Gary. Oh. I am attractive. I'm getting that promotion. I am getting younger. I am, I am. You know what that is? That's profane, yeah. secular babbling. Yeah. It means nothing. What does it increase to? It will increase unto more ungodliness. Yeah. America's in the state that it's in today because of the doctrine coming out of the pulpits. You're right. Now look at what Paul says there. He said, study. That's, that's the command. Yeah. There's nothing else going to approve you unto God in this world other than studying. <clears throat> it's, it's study that approves us unto God. Now, now look at what he said. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. And so this morning we're actually going to look at these. We've been looking at the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the uncircumcision. And this morning we're actually going to start looking at the scriptures where those two gospels are contained and show you why rightly dividing is so important. It's important. Yeah. Hebrews says, listen, let me go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. Hebrews says you can partake of the Holy Ghost, fall away, and then be burned. Yeah, yeah. That's what it says. Yeah. Hebrews says to fear, lest any of us, lest, lest, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Yeah. Take heed, lest there be in any one of you an, uh, 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 an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. T. Bruce story. Lest there be any profane or fornicator as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Mm -hmm. That's Hebrews. Yeah. You think John's any better? First John, that's the book for new Christians. Abide in him. That's John. That that comes. That that's building upon the doctrine of, 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 of John chapter fifteen, the Gospel of John. I am the true vine. Yeah. You want to Christ say, I am the true vine. Every branch in me that bringeth not forth fruit, he taketh away. Mm -hmm. And if any branch abide not in me, men gather them, and they are burned. All right. This is the gospel of the circumcision, man. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. People just wonder, oh, it's all for me. Okay. You, listen, listen, let me tell you something. Here's how people are with the Bible. They'll go to 1 John and Peter and Hebrews, and what's good, they'll take. Amen. And what's bad, they don't want. Yeah. You don't, it's, not, it's not how it works. You don't get to rob Israel of every good thing they get and not take the cursings with it. Yeah. Yeah. Once you put yourself in one jot or ten of those epistles, then it's all you. If chapter 3 is talking about you, chapter 4 is too. Yeah. And that's just the bottom line, man. And so we're going to see why it's so important to rightly divide. And we're also going to see that failure to do so is the root problem. It's the root of all heresy and confusion today. Let me show you this word. We've talked about this word here. Confusion. We've been teaching on, on baptism here. Ephesians chapter 4, there's one baptism. We've been talking about the one baptism here on Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. we, th that Bible's been around for 2,000 years. 
And Christianity still doesn't have a clear doctrine on baptism. Amen. That's pathetic. Yes, sir. Yeah. That is pathetic. The Roman Catholic says it's this, and the Church of Christ says, no, it's this. And the Baptist says, no, uh, uh And then the Methodists say, but it's like this. And the Presbyterians are like, no, it's like this. That's pathetic. Yeah. It really is. Amen. Now, you see what this word means? This word, confuse. What is it? That word means a mixing of things that are contrary. When you mix things, when you mix things that are contrary one to another, for example, Romans says you can't lose your salvation, Hebrews does. And then you say, well, they're both for me, and you mix them together, you've confused the Amen. matter. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. What's the solution to it? Right Amen. division. Amen. You don't mix things contrary, you divide them. Amen. And it's really that simple. People's like, well, I heard Ruckman one time. He was talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And he says there's a lot of things about them that are similar, but there's some things about them that are different. Yeah. He said a dog and a cat come around the corner. And once somebody says, well, they both have hair. And he said, yes. And they both have four paws. Uh-huh. And they both have ears. Yeah. And they both have eyes. Yes. And they both have a tail. Yes. They're the same. He said, no, one's a dog, one's a cat. You can't, you can't take, because something's similar, that's not the issue. The issue is what's different about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And anybody that spends any amount of time in Hebrews and Romans knows that they're contrary. They're different. Yeah. Paul said in Romans, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. James 2.24 says, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. They're different. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> what are you to do? Study. Yeah, that's right. To show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Yeah. And so come to Hebrews. This is the book. This is where we're going to start. <laughs> now, <coughs> Let me draw you a very basic little timeline up here. It ain't gonna be too it ain't gonna be too detailed. But we've we've looked at this. God has a prophetic program and God has a mystery. There that those you know what those are? Those are different. Yes. What's prophecy? It's something that's been revealed. What's a mystery? It's something that's been hid. Alright, amen. Yeah. They're different. And if you mix these two programs together, what are you going to do? Confuse. Yeah, that's right. But if you rightly divide them, you'll, God will reveal this, this wonderful, eternal plan that he's had since the beginning of the world. Yeah. You'll understand where Israel falls into it, what's God's plan for the earth. You'll see where we fall into it, what's God's plan for the body of Christ. It's, it's, it reveals the mystery of God's will. Okay? So prophecy has been spoken since the world began, Genesis 1-1. The mystery has been hid in God from the beginning, Ephesians 3-10. Okay? Okay? So you, from Genesis 1 <coughs> all the way up to the Apostle Paul, you're dealing with prophecy. Amen? Yes. Amen. That's what you're dealing with. All right? Then you get up here and you, you, had, you had the prophets in the Old Testament. And then Jesus Christ shows up. John, John the Baptist, Jesus said... The law and the prophets prophesied until John. Right there. Yep. Okay? So John marked the end of these, this, these prophets. Mm -hmm. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, God who, look there in verse 1, God who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake when? In time past, unto who? By who? The prophets. John was the end of it. Jesus said the law and the prophets prophesied until John. God in sundry times by his manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in his last days spoken unto us by his son. Amen. Jesus Christ. It's verse 2. Yes, sir. Now, we don't have to guess. Listen, the writer 
of Hebrews, if you read your Bible, the first two verses tell you what the book's about. It's not about you, and it ain't about the church age, and it has nothing to do with the mystery. The same God who spoke to Israel by the prophets in the Old Testament has now spoken unto Israel by His Son. When Christ was on this earth, Romans 15 and 8, Paul said that He was a minister of the circumcision. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That's Jesus Christ. His earthly ministry had nothing to do with you. Right. Had nothing to do with the Gentiles. It was for Israel. Right. And this is what the book of Hebrews is. Look in chapter 2 verse 3. Mm. How shall we escape? Who's the we? Israel. God never spoke to Gentiles in time past by the prophets. So then who's the book? It's about Israel. Look at what he says. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? I'll give you a little word study. Look at word escape up in a concordance. And then go back to the prophets and, and see what God said about escaping. Ezekiel says that there's, there's some that are going to escape. Where do they go? They go to the mountains. Let them be which be in Judea walk flee into the mountains. Mm -hmm. But now you, you see this. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by who? Lord. And was confirmed unto us by who? Heard <coughs> That's the twelve apostles. Yeah. The twelve apostles were not given the commission that Paul was given. That's right. Right. You yeah. say, how do you know that? Because Jesus told them, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Amen. They were sent to baptize, Paul wasn't. Right. Not the same commission. Yeah. Yeah. They were sent to preach. Now in Matthew 28, they're sent to preach the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. He had just told them this back in Matthew 24, folks. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then shall the end come. Four chapters later, he says, Go ye therefore to all the world, teaching all nations. What are they teaching them? To observe all things whatsoever Christ had commanded them. They're teaching the law. Yeah. Yeah. When we get to James, you're going to see that all James is... James is, a, is an exposition of the Sermon on the Mount. James is teaching pure law, baby. There's no, that, listen, you find me the death and resurrection of Christ in James and I'll give you a hundred bucks. He ain't preaching, he's preaching law. He said, so speak ye and so do as them that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Okay. He shall have mercy without judgment on them that have shown them. This is what James is talking about. People just tear through there and you know what they think? They think, well, I love people and I show mercy, therefore I'm saved. That ain't going to save you today. <laughs> it ain't going to happen, man. You see, do you see the importance of what we're saying? Okay, so these 12 in, earth, in the book of Acts, chapters 1 through 7, they're preaching the kingdom of that was preached by John and Jesus Christ. They are confirming it to the nation of Israel. They fall in Acts 7. <clears throat> you know what Stephen preaches in Acts 7? He preaches all this. Hmm. And he says, you've taken Christ. You've, he, said, he said, which of the prophets have your fathers not or persecuted? Who foretold of the coming of the just one by whom you have now taken and with wicked hands been the murderers thereof. And they take him out in the street and they gnash on him and they, they stone him in the street there. And in Acts chapter 9, God calls Paul. You see, God's plan is to save the nations through the salvation of Israel. But what I love about it is when Israel fell, Gary, he didn't let it stop him. He started saving Gentiles in spite of Israel. Yeah, amen. I love that. Yeah. Amen. What did he do? He, he showed Paul the mystery. This is just a basic timeline. After this mystery's over, the rapture's a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. Not all shall sleep, but all shall be changed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye. All right? The 
the Jew will go through their time of trouble, and then at the second coming, they go into their kingdom. This is the Bible timeline, all right? Mm -hmm. Now look there in Hebrews 2.1. I've already showed you what the book of Hebrews is about. Hebrews 2.1. Therefore, what's he, say, what's, what's, what's he talking about here? Christ has spoken. God sent his son and spoke to Israel. God had spoke to Israel in time past by angels. That's how the law was given. And what he's saying is, is this man has been made much better than the angels for God never looked at any of the angels and said, sit on my right hand. Yeah. God had never looked at any of these angels and said, I'm going to make you heir of all things in heaven and earth. This man by inheritance received a better name than they. Yeah. Yeah. And so now he's saying, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Uh-oh, somebody's in danger now. Keep up. You want to lose your salvation? Here's a good place to lose it. Look at verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receive the just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's a good place to lose it. Hmm. Yeah. What, if, what, what if you let it slip? Let what slip? First of all. You say, you say, what if we let it slip? Here's what Paul said. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That's salvation. Amen. The moment you heard and believed the gospel, you were baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. Yeah. If you're dead, you're going to live. You say, how do I die with it? By one baptism into one body. Yeah. You say, how do I get that? By believing the gospel. Nothing more. Right. And if you're dead with him, you're going to live with him. Amen. If we suffer, we shall reign. That has to do with reward. If we deny him, he also will deny us what? The reward. Yeah. That's why he says over in 1 Corinthians, he says, he says, if any man's works be burned up, he shall suffer loss, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Mm -hmm. And so right here in that now, what's he say next? If we, Paul, Paul put himself in this list, him and Timothy both, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Amen. Amen. Folks, you ain't going to lose this yeah. thing right here. There you go. <laughs> you're baptized into his death, his burial, his resurrection, and you're already ascended and seated in heavenly places Amen. in him. Yeah. Blessed with all spiritual blessings. This is not what Hebrews is talking about. Hebrews applies to a bunch of Jews under tribulation, yeah. in chastisement trying to get to this point here in which they are going to receive the promise. They haven't received it yet. Yes, right. But the promise is there. And he says, don't let these things slip. Because if you neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken unto the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, how are you going to escape if you neglect so great salvation? This is what Hebrews is. Come down to chapter verse 10. Try that one off the sides. <laughs> and now here, here, this, is what, this is just what people do. For it became him. It became God. For whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. What in the world is this verse talking about? First off, notice that word there. Now, folks, this, listen, this verse is not a doctrine for today. Right. God didn't, I mean, I mean, we know Christ suffered for our sins. But what the writer of Hebrews is talking about is their, their captain of their salvation, the one leading them, the one that's out in front of them and leading them to salvation. It, he had to come to this earth. It became him to come down here in leading these men to glory. He had to suffer. Yeah. Why? Because they're going to be saved out of a time of great trouble. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is what the Hebrews is talking about. Look at that word there. 
to make the captain of their salvation. What salvation is he talking about? Hebrews 2, 3 told you it's the salvation that at first began to be spoken by the Lord. It's Israel. Mm -hmm. So what's these sufferings about? Our, our salvation, Christ died, was buried, rose again from the dead, ascended back to heaven, and we have a part in all of it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The salvation of Israel is different. Paul said, Romans 11, 25, he said, I will not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning this mystery, yeah. that blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, out of Zion cometh the deliverer. They're saved at the second coming after the church age. Mm -hmm. yeah. After the dispensation of grace, Israel is going to be saved at the second coming. But we also know from prophecy, right here, we know from that prophetic program that Israel is going to be saved out of a time of trouble. That's Jeremiah 37. You know what he says? It is the time. Alas, that day is great so that none is like it. Even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Israel is going to be saved out of a time of great trouble. So what did God do for the captain? He sent their, the captain of their salvation down here. Mm -hmm. When Jesus goes into the wilderness, you ever wonder why? The Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You ever wonder why? What it was all about? Well, Israel's going into the wilderness at the halfway point of the tribulation. Right. And Satan comes down there and he says, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Yeah. All this will I give you if you but fall down and worship me. Mm -hmm. You realize the devil's going to be sitting in the temple of Jerusalem and all that Jew has to do, all that Jew has to do, Gary, to get his luxury back and his riches back and to get food in his belly is to just simply fall down and worship the Antichrist in the temple. Yeah. Everything Christ is going through right here, Israel is going to go through up here. And what God is doing is He's making their captain of their salvation. This is why the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, remember, he, he says, let us run with grace the patience, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising its shame and is set down on the right hand of God the Father. The author is his sufferings. The finisher is the glory. So what does the writer of Hebrews come on down there and say? If you endure chastening. Then what's he say in chapter, at the end of the chapter? We receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Israel is going to have to endure that time of chastisement, Bill. Yeah. They're going to have to go through these sufferings. Look over in Isaiah chapter 50. Let me show you this. <coughs> Israel, well, go to Isaiah 50. Let me read you these scriptures. Israel is going to have to endure to this point right here. Israel's salvation does not come to here. So when, you, when you're reading the, the Jewish epistles, you have to understand that Paul said, Paul writes, you've got it. You've got it all. You, you're, in, you're in Christ. You've got everything. The writer of the, the, the Jewish epistles is, it's coming. Yeah. It'll right. be here. James says, be patient, therefore, unto the coming of our Lord. Yeah. Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Gird up the loins of your mind and hope unto the end for the grace that shall be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.13 Those are different. They're different, Gary. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's, what does Israel have to do? Israel has to make it. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24.13 mm -hmm. They have to endure. They have to make it. Hebrews 3.6 says this. Y'all stay in Isaiah 50. Let me read you these verses. Israel's going to have to make it. Listen to what Hebrews 3, 6 says. But, but Christ as a son over his own, own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now what he's talking about is he's comparing Jesus and Moses. 
And he, was, he says, Moses was a faithful servant in the house of God, but Christ as a son over his own house. That's, that's, that's the difference between Moses. And, Moses was like a servant in the house, Gary. Yeah. Yeah. Christ is as a son. And then he, he, Christ, now, now he says, whose house are we? Israel. When Christ comes back, Israel becomes his, the, the inheritance of Christ. Yeah. And he, but he says, if we hold the confidence of our, the, if we hold the, the, the rejoicing of our hope steadfast unto the end. Hebrews 3.14 says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. They partake of Christ if they hold out to the end, Gary. Yeah. Know what Paul said? We're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh yeah. right now. Yes. Amen. Amen. Wait until the end. I'm, all, I'm already in it. That's right. Amen. All right. Now look at Isaiah. You talk about a wonderful verse, man. Christ, the captain of their salvation, how through sufferings. Look at Isaiah 50 and 4. What a God, man. What a God. Now what's it? How, how's Israel ever going to make it through this period right here? You know what they're going to have to do? The only chance they got of getting through this and enduring? Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to see this. In chapter 4 it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passing into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Mm. He was tempted at every point as they are in the time of tribulation, but without sin. And that's who they are going to have to look to under this time. Look in Isaiah 50 and verse 4. What a God, man. Listen to this verse. It says, Christ speaking. The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned. You know what? You know how he learned? <laughs> Hebrews 5 7 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he suffered. Yeah. Look what he says. God hath given me the tongue of the learned. Why? That I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Mm -hmm. God gave Christ the tongue of a learned man so that he would know how to speak in a season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Well, how did God teach him? Verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters, mm -hmm. and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Mm -hmm. When he's going through this suffering, God has given him the tongue of a learned man so that out here in this time of trouble, he will know how to give a word to them that are weary. That's why the writer of Hebrews says he is, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And so, what the, look, look, look back in Hebrews now. What a, what, man, my goodness, what a book, guys. <laughs> what a book. Listen, man, I have no problem you applying some of that to you. But you need to get the doctrine first before you tear through that Bible and think it's all about you and get so messed up you don't know up from down anymore. Right. <laughs> and so by the time you get to Hebrews chapter 3, the writer of Hebrews has laid out two things. Number one, God sent His Son to speak to the nation of Israel. This Son suffered and then went back to heaven. So what does this make Him? Look at Hebrews 3.1. Wherefore, uh, consider the apostle and high priest. Holy brethren, part of the heaven. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. An apostle is one sent. So Christ came and he spoke to Israel as an apostle. And then he suffered as a man and went back to heaven as a high priest. And he's saying, consider the apostle and high priest of, of our profession. And he said, for this man was, what, what apostle does he compare him to? The one that Israel esteemed higher than all men, Moses. He said, this man's counted more worthy of glo glory, more, more, more glory than even Moses is. Yeah. So what does that mean? Well, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. 
So in Hebrews 10, he's going to say, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who should be who trodden underfoot the blood of the, uh, of the Son of God, or counted the blood of the covenant of holy. So he's saying, consider this man, consider this apostle. Every word that Moses spoke, there was a just recompense of reward. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That was the law of Moses. You know what Christ did? He came to the earth and he raised the standard. Hmm. It's been said by them of old, thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, whosoever is angry at his brother without cause yeah. is in danger of judgment. It's been said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman with lust in his heart hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Mm -hmm. He's done raised the standard. This is the apostle. <laughs> this is the son of God. What chance does Israel have? Mm -hmm. Look, look there. Look, look down in chapter 4. Look there in chapter 4, verse 1. Well, Moses leads Israel out of Egypt. But you know what happens? Every last one of them, except, except two and, and their kids, all fall victim in the wilderness. Yeah. None of them make it to the land. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. They sent 12 spies over. Ten died in the wilderness. You get over there, get over to the book of Numbers and see how many come out of Egypt. Yeah. You know what he says right here in chapter 4, verse 1? Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Yeah. I ain't worried about that, Gary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amen. Look at verse 2. He tells you what he's talking about. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Who? The Jews in the wilderness. He's saying the same gospel preached to Israel in the wilderness has been preached unto us. What is it? It's about entering the land and getting the kingdom and getting a land that flows with milk and honey. And it's going to come through this man right here. Yeah. Yeah. He said, but you've got to make it to that day. He said that this promise is ours, man, but you can come short of it. It has nothing to do with me. Amen. Nothing. Let us fear. So what must they do? They must look unto Jesus. And, and so, so he's done, he's done laid, he's compared Christ to Moses. In chapter 5, he compares Christ to Aaron. You say, you say that you're losing me, exactly, because it's not for you. <laughs> Hey Amen. I mean, if you're not skilled in Leviticus and Exodus, what are you doing trying to master Hebrews? That's how people are. He's sitting here, he's like, Christ is better than Moses. Christ is better than Aaron. You're like, I don't know nothing about Moses and Aaron. Then what are you doing trying to mess around in the book of Hebrews? Now, honestly. All right, so what's he say here? Chapter 5. I'm just giving you a brief overview of what Hebrews is about. In chapter 5, now he compares Christ to Aaron. He's done compared him to Moses, the, the apostle of the old covenant. Now he's going to compare him to Aaron, the high priest of the old covenant. Yeah. And what's he say? That Christ has been made a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Mm. Meaning Christ is not even a priest by the old covenant. If God made a different order, then there must be a, a different law in place. Following this. The Levite priesthood is over. The Aaronic priesthood is over. Christ is called, look there, Hebrews 5.10, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. <coughs> Did you know how great Melchizedek was? Abraham gave him tithes of all that he had. Yeah. Abraham. This man was so great that Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. And you know what the writer of Hebrews says? He says, he basically says, if I may be so bold as to say, Levi was in his loins when he paid that tithes. Levi was in the loins of Abraham. He was still in Abraham's flesh. So Levi's paying tithes to Melchizedek. And he's showing this to show that the priesthood of Christ is higher. Now here's, here's the... You've got to understand this, folks, because we're coming into chapter 6. 
A verse used by free wills and Methodists and Pentecostals to scare people half to death. And it's probably a verse and a chapter that has scared many saved people today. Mm -hmm. If they shall fall away. Yep. Hebrews 6, yep. 6. Yep. <coughs> this, is that, this is that verse. When, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with new Christians or baby Christians, I've dealt with people for, say, 15 years. And they find out you know a lot about the Bible. Here's the first thing they're going to ask you. What does Hebrews 6 mean? Mm -hmm. Amen? What about Hebrews 10, 26, and 27? Those are the two most troubling passages for Christians today. Yeah. And you're not going to understand it if you don't understand what the message of Hebrews is about. Look at what he tells them. Bert, well, well, let's jump down to chapter 6, verse 4. Let me read these verses to you. For it is impossible. I'll close with this, these verses right here. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, watch this, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. These yeah. people partook in the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Those powers of the world to come is the signs and wonders of the kingdom. The healing of the blind, the, the giving sight to the blind and he, uh, healing the deaf and raising the dead. He said it's impossible for these people, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put into an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars has rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. What's mm -hmm. some off? What's some? That's, that's the Bible though, folks. The Bible ain't all sunshine and rainbows, man. Hey, Amen? Yeah. yeah. Those are some scary verses. Whoever they're written about, they're scary. Now, if they're written about you, they're scary. What, what cracks me up, man, is these free wills and people like that. They, oh, you can lose. They, they, every Sunday, they ain't preaching until they try to tell you that you can lose your salvation. Yeah. But then you know what? They, they, they'll run to a verse like Hebrews and say, see, Hebrews says you can lose it. What else does it say? It says that if you do lose it, if you fall away, you cannot be renewed. Yeah. Yeah. What happens to you? You're burned. Verse 8. Read it. Mm -hmm. There's no more coming to the altar and getting saved again and getting rebaptized. In fact, the right back in chapter verse 1 and 2, he says, not laying again a foundation of repentance toward de of dead works and a faith toward God and the doctrine of baptisms. He says it's either on to perfection or the bonfire. There's no more laying again of these foundations. He said, it's done. He said, let us go on to perfection. This we will do if God permit, for it is impossible for them who would want to. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. There's no getting saved again. These people who use these verses to teach you to lose your salvation are some of the most inconsistent hypocrites in the world. And I mean that with all charity in my heart. They're inconsistent. I'll tell you, the verse does say somebody can fall away. The verse even says that a man can partake of the Holy Ghost and still fall away and make it to a bonfire. That just ain't Pauline doctrine. Amen. Yeah, two things we were taught on that in here. The notes is, number one, they weren't truly saved. They just tasted of what salvation. The other one was the, uh, they did the unpardonable sin. That, <laughs> here, here's the thing. Nobody in this period is saved in the sense that we are. Yeah, sure. They've heard the word of God. They even partook of the Holy Ghost. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Mm -hmm. God, God knocked them dead on the spot, man. And people are like, oh, they, they were living. They, they think that's the body of Christ there. If you think that people were living under grace when God killed them for not giving everything that they had to, to, the, to the, 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 the apostles... How many times, I mean, our churches would be empty if God was living by that principle today. Yeah. Then people weren't under the dispensation of grace. That's kingdom stuff going on. Mm -hmm. You say, why did God kill them? What did Jesus say? Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and follow thou me. Mm -hmm. 
Who for the, remember, remember the sufferings and the glory. So what did he say? If any man want to be my disciple, he must first take up, deny himself, take up the cross and follow after me. This is the doctrine of this period right here. They're going to have to suffer for Christ. Yeah. Now he tells them, all right, in order to understand Hebrews 6, all right, Paul never taught that you could partake of the Holy Ghost and then fall away and end up in hell or being burned. That's right. Paul said, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit of promise. Mm -hmm. Ephesians, you say, what if, what, if, what, if we don't, what if we mess up? Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Spirit of God by which you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Yeah. You are sealed even if you grieve Him. So what's Hebrews 6 talking about? A few seconds right here. Look, verse 6. If they shall fall away. That's what, that's, what, that's what you have to understand there. What does that mean? You don't get to just make it up. People go over there and they say, if they shall fall away. To them, that means fornication or slipping up saying a cuss word or getting drunk one time. Or they, that's what they think falling away means. And, but that's not what it means in the context there. What's the context? What did he tell them to leave in verse 1? The principles of the doctrine of Christ and go on to perfection. <clears throat> what were the principles? Levi, Aaron. What he's showing here is he's saying Christ is superior to Moses. Christ is superior to Aaron. Mm -hmm. His blood is better than the blood of bulls and goats. Yeah. He's a high priest over a greater sanctuary than the earth saints, the earthly sanctuary. He's made a surety of a better testament than the one that Moses gave us. He's saying you have all these things in Christ and if you fall away back to those things under the law, it's like you've crucified the Son of God afresh. You've denied Him afresh and put Him to an open shame and you cannot be saved. Why? Because Israel... When this kingdom comes, two things are going to keep them from getting into it. Sin and unbelief. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews said that in Hebrews chapter 3. Come to John 15 and I'm done. I promise you. i got to finish this chapter because right, I don't want to get through it and not finish it. We'll pick up with, uh, we'll move into Hebrews chapter 10 next week. But in John chapter 15, here's what you have to get. John the Baptist showed up. You know what he's preaching? He's preaching the wrath to come. Mm -hmm. And the kingdom at hand. John the Baptist said, The axe is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Didn't we just read about somebody who brought forth thorns and briars and was rejected yeah. and whose end was to be burned? The axe is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. For I have baptized you with water unto repentance. He that cometh after me, who is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not able to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan, whose fan is in his hand, and he shall thoroughly purge his threshing floor, and his wheat shall he gather into the garner, the kingdom. Yeah. But the chaff shall be burned up with unquenchable fire. So what does Israel have to do? They have to bring forth good fruit. How are they going to bring forth good fruit? John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bringeth, beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Look down in verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in them, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. What's Israel have to do? They're going to have to abide in Christ. Mm -hmm. Now we're in. Now here's the difference. People, people, people come over here. People, here's people. They're like the vine and the branches. I hear, I hear you know, Ignorant preachers preach on stuff like that all the time. They don't know what they're doing. They're like, they see the similarities. Christ is divine and we're the branches coming off of him. So that's just like Christ is the head and we're the members. Okay, similarities, right? They're similar. 
Well, let's think about the differences for a second. Amen. If I've got a vine or a fruit tree in my yard and I see an unfruitful branch, I'm going to take it off and throw it away. Are you, are you going to treat your body like that? Mm -hmm. Get a little pain in your middle finger, just cut that thing off. Or your arm gives you a little bit of trouble, yank it. You think God's going to treat the body of His Son, Jesus Christ, the way He would an unfruitful branch in a vine? Do you see the differences yes. between a body and a... That's how people are today. They don't even know the difference between a body and a vine. <laughs> now, see, you say, what is the vine? That's God's plan for Israel. Every, every circumcised Jew in Christ that abides in Christ and brings forth fruit are going to go into the kingdom. Yeah. Every branch in him that don't bear fruit, he's going to take away. What's he going to do with it? He's going to have a bonfire there at the second coming. Yeah. Amen? You think he's going to, you say, that's not, that's not how he's going to do the body of Christ. Yeah, right. You are all one in Christ. We're eternally saved. I hope, I hope you see the differences in what these what the writer of Hebrews is talking about, what Paul talks about in Romans. They're different. Completely different. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll pick back up with it next week. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for another day. Lord, we understand.